thank you for joining our virtual open day. Uh, we are a bit disappointed that we can't show you our school face to face today and with our students as we normally do. Um, so that you can see our beautiful school with its natural surroundings, but um, we are hoping that we're back to normal very soon and we can invite you for a face to face meeting school tour and even trial days. Um, uh, for now, uh, we have to refer to the pre-recorded tours which you've received in your email. And um, I will now pass on to our principal, Dr. Lorenz Metzger, who will introduce everyone else and who will start his presentation. Lawrence? Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to have you here in our virtual open day today. A very warm welcome from me. Uh, thank you, Antje. She's our registrar, and I, I'm sure most of you have spoken to her already or have had email conversations with her. Um, and she's our meeting host today. I would also like to welcome Horst Giesler, our deputy principal. Good afternoon. Um, hope he's visible for everyone. Yeah. Um, Annie Thompson, our head of senior secondary school and Thomas Schartowitz, our head of junior secondary school. Afternoon. Um, you will later have the opportunity to also meet Clemens Pedanik, the head of our primary school, and Silke Beske, um, head of our preschool. So, uh, extraordinary times, uh, extraordinary um, ways to, to address you and to talk to you and to get in touch to you. We, as Antje already said, um, we have that virtual open day today. We have virtual school tours. We would love to welcome you on campus, um, get into personal conversations with you, show you around in our beautiful area that we have uh, on our Terry Hills campus. Um, have you speak to students as well and parents as well. Um, um, we usually have student tours and of course they can give you a different perspective than I, I can and will do as a principal. Um, and it's just uh, not possible at this time, but we make the best of it and, and try to be as, as communicative and, and authentic as possible. So um, my job will be to give you a little bit of an overview over the whole school of who we are and what we are as a very unique school uh, in the Sydney area. And then we will, um, work on in a Q&A session and, and through the um, agenda that I'm sure you're aware of already. So I'll try to share my screen with you now. Let's see if that works. Okay, here we go. Aren't you give me the thumbs up if, if that looks good? Okay, I hope everyone can see that. So I'm going to introduce you to our school. I'm not sure if you've been there. We're in Terry Hills in a very beautiful natural environment, um, which has its advantages and disadvantages that are a little bit off the beaten track for some, but uh, it's, it's a beautiful setting in nature. And that is quite significant, uh, especially for the students. Um, last year, we had a, um, an, uh, an interview around our campus development project and the students, the setting, and uh, being in that, in that atmosphere, being uh, surrounded by nature and having sustainability as, as a key motive as well, was very, um, very important. So in a nutshell, we were founded in 1989 in uh, Ryde in Sydney. Uh, so we've been in existence for 30 years here. We're located in Terry Hill since about 12 years. Um, we're close to 400 students going all the way from preschool to year 12 and many, many different nationalities. It's hard to count them. And on that uh, slide in the bottom, you see something that's very important uh, probably for you. Um, we accept students without prior knowledge of the German language. Although, of course, the German language, as well as the English language and other things are a big focus in our school. So our school offers a truly international bilingual education. 
and uh, we combine curricula from New South Wales, Germany, and the IBO syllabus for the final two years. We offer the IB baccalaureate program, and that comes and that goes all the way through from, from preschool to um, all the way through to the IB uh, with very modern approaches of teaching and learning and approaches that are internationally recognized in our small caring school community. So let me go into the pedagogics just in, on a very high level overview. So you can have a look, or I will show a slide later on, on the IB Learner profile. Um, we are really trying to build personalities and competencies and skills that are important for lifelong learners. And we do that according to our teaching and learning framework. If you want, you can have a more detailed look at it on our website um, with the five key areas and specific goals um, that are um, phrased for those key areas. Lifelong learners, learning excellence, international education, community is very important to us, the well-being of our students, and the continuous innovative development. So truly international education, what does that really mean? Um, it starts with the kids. We have kids from many, many different countries. Um, I would say around 50% are of Australian background and around 50% are other nationalities, predominantly German, but also Austrian, Swiss, Brazilian, Italian, you name it. So that's a very um, broad mix of children coming from different uh, backgrounds, different countries, bringing with them sometimes different languages other than German and English as their mother tongue and uh, coming together in an international setting in an international uh, school and an international campus. And of course that also um, is true for our staff. Um, our staff I would say predominantly, predominantly comes from Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Australia and England, but there are other members of staff as well. And they bring with them different professional backgrounds. They were educated in different countries. and They're all um, wholeheartedly um, pedagogic, pedagogic thinking and living and breathing people um, who work with your children. And I think it's really a big asset of our school and something that makes us unique that our staff is so international. And, um, tries to achieve the best in every situation for your children. Um, as a New South Wales school, although we are a German international school, I'll get to that in a second. As a New South Wales school, we're of course 100% um, like other New South Wales schools in the sense that we have to adhere to all the standards, the curricula, the regulations for, that, that are valid in, uh, for, for any New South Wales school. In addition, our curriculum is, is enriched by um, what the German authorities um, well, see as a core of the curriculum. And we are part of the network of about 140 German international schools worldwide. Uh, so there's one in Sydney, there's one in New York, there's one in Paris and so forth. They're all a bit different, but they all have a mix of curricula that are nationally based plus uh, enrichment from Germany or more German based and enrichment from uh, where they're located. Um, our school is unique in the, in the fact that we have the RBO syllabus in year 11 and 12 and the international baccalaureate is an exam as you may know that is becoming more and more popular around uh, New South Wales and Australia as well. Um, the IBO is an international organization, not for profit, that has um, the, the aim to, to empower students and to give them a, a certificate, a diploma that will allow them uh, to study anywhere in the world. So we are a bilingual school. Um, a number of other schools have languages, almost any school. But 
Bilingualism is something totally different. It is not, well, we use a few words in a language and, and take a dive there. It is immersive and we try to, when the children come to our school early enough, really make them fully proficient and fully competent in English and German. And that has a lot of benefits that are outlined here. There are cognitive benefits that are proven uh, in, the re in the area of memory, focused attention, uh, increased multitasking skills. But perhaps more importantly, um, I would say that they're really building opportunities for life. And I can really say that because uh, with my family, I've spent two years in the US and five years at the German International School in Hong Kong. And I saw my little children at that time um, thriving in that environment and, and uh, you know, developing their, their personalities and it really makes a difference. So even if you as a parent probably don't want your children to run away after they graduated school, it's just a, um, it, it's a great feeling that basically they graduated in an international school like ours. They can basically have yeah, the feeling they can basically make it anywhere. They have built the, the competencies, the skills, the language proficiency, the open mindedness, uh, the openness and respect and appreciation of diversity, cultural diversity, language diversity um, that will allow them to lead a life that's, that's open and that can be. Um, can, can bring them to different countries for study or for work. Um, speaking of studying, um, it's worth mentioning that uh, in Germany, tertiary education is free. So all the university courses, um, whatever it is, is free of charge. Um, that's a big incentive, I think, for some of our students and families as well. Um, with the German uh, language skills that the children will um, develop here that they could also study in Germany. And one point that I made on that slide as well is the ability to learn further languages. So that's really a, pro a proven fact that if a child has learned two languages at an early age, it's much easier to pick up a third language should that be uh, important. At some point in, in their lives, they want to pick up Spanish or whatever other language because um, their life leads them into, into such a country, it's much easier to develop that and pick that up. Right. Okay, so how is language taught? Of course, we have German classes, we have English classes, but what do we do in science, music, and so on? So we call it content and language integrated learning. Um, language is all, always a focus because in any of our classes, there are children with different language backgrounds. So for example, myself as a physics teacher, uh, I have to be aware, although I teach a physics class in English, that there are varying levels of, of language competencies in this class and um, the children are immersed in the English language in the sciences in physics and chemistry. There are other subjects in secondary school that are taught in German. Um, that's sports, music and arts, that's taught in German for everyone. Then there are some subjects where there's a choice. Maths, for example, can be chosen in German and in English. So there's a mixture in secondary school uh, of some subjects that are in English, some in German, and some where there's a choice and we build the bridges that are necessary to acquire the language competencies, competencies there. In primary school and in preschool, it's a different approach. Um, there we have several staff in preschool and in primary school, typically two staff in the classroom with the children at any given time, one native English speaker and one native German speaker. And we really, again, try to teach them the language, not in the way of what, like you would do it as a second language in English and German, that happens as well, but in everyday life and in other subjects in an immersive way. And that's, 
summarize here on this slide. We also have French and Spanish language programs in secondary school and a choice, for example, in the IB in the final two years of languages of the whole language portfolio. So children can choose German, English, French, and Spanish. Bilinguality is our main academic focus, I would say. Um, science is also taught differently than typically in Australian schools because we don't have science as a subject in secondary. So we split it into um, the sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics, as you may expect you know, from uh, the image that Germany probably has. Um, with a connotation to, to engineering and, and uh, science. And we start building that at a very early age. Our preschool has been awarded uh, many years in a row now with a uh, little scientist award. And in primary, that continues in general studies. And then in secondary, as I just said, we, we split in um, the three different sizes, which means that the students can have up to six lessons per week in the three different sciences. Okay, all right, so much for that. Just jumped on to the next one. And, and it, uh, it goes on in the IB, obviously, where chemistry, biology, and physics can be selected um, as an option. Okay, of course, we have all other subjects, or many other subjects that you would expect uh, from a school as well. The sport, unfortunately, we don't have a big rugby field, but we have a swim school next door, for example. We have a beautiful sports hall. Uh, we have an outdoor soccer field. So uh, we're, we're very aware that academic um, progression and learning is very important, but we take a very holistic view of, of teaching and learning, and sports is obviously uh, an integral part of its education, as is music. We're building our um, music um, ensembles, uh, choirs from an early age, and uh, we try to develop that further into the higher years of junior secondary and, and the IB, and that's a growing area. And if you've seen your child or other young children performing on a stage, it, you just see how much that means to them. and, and how it builds their character as well. Um, a few words on the International Baccalaureate. I've mentioned a few things already. So there's a, a, quite a wide subject choice available. Um, and the end result, the uh, diploma program that uh, the students are awarded really facilitates their, uh, not only their entry into universities of choice, so our students, as far as I'm aware, everyone gets the, into the universities in Australia and in other countries where they actually, that they're actually aiming for. The universities really welcome this approach that is characteristic for the IB because it um, builds a very good foundation for um, self-dependent academic, academic studies at university and that has also lived in our school in a camp, little bit of campus-like atmosphere um, which is not as uh, tightly regulated as maybe in, uh, in other programs. So we don't offer the HSC, we don't offer the German Abitur, we try to enable and empower all of our students to achieve the IV. And the learner profile, um, that's published by the IBO, the International Baccalaureate Organization, um, is really a very modern 21st century approach. Have a look at it, either on our website or on an IBO web website. But there are uh, a lot of skills mentioned there um, that we really try to build in this school from a, an early age on. Through approaches in, to teaching and learning that, again, are inspired by approaches in different countries um, with a big emphasis on uh, reflective learning, on, um, on responsibility um, for their own learning for the children, which 
we try to build very early. So our goal is for every student to reach their highest academic standard according to his and her personal potential. Um, the results that we have speak for themselves. We have NAPLAN results that are consistently above average and just uh, last year it's been published. Um, our NAPLAN, NAPLAN results in junior secondary school are the second best of all schools in the Northern Beaches area, which is really, I think, a great, um, uh, great achievement. Given the fact that we are a school that's um, non-selective, uh, non-denote, Nominational, I think that's the right word. Um, um, very open, uh, co educational course. We have excellent German year 10 exams. Um, those are exams that are written in all German international schools worldwide, and compared to those, we're always achieving very well. We have German language, we offer German language diploma uh, on two different levels that uh, also. Uh, support studies in the university and our IB diploma results are consistently well above world average and um, yeah in addition to those academic achievements of course you can look at data from uh, inspections and ratings and our school has the advantage um, to be inspected quite a lot by NASA uh, New South Wales uh, Department of of education authority by the RBO and by the German government. And uh, that gives us valuable input to, to develop our teaching and learning in our curriculum. So I, I spoke about that already. So we take a holistic approach to teaching and learning. We're very aware that emotional uh, and social and physical well being plays a big part in the development of children and supports their academic learning and, and it's very important to us. And to take a perspective that, you know, it's sometimes hard. Of course, you have to learn for the next test next week, um, but also to, to inspire um, curiosity and, and uh, desire to, to develop yourself and, and um, strive for what you can achieve. Um, we usually have a lot of exciting events um, across the school year. This year, of course, has been very different. For example, our Christmas market in August, which attracted last year almost 8,000 people on two days. And I think that's a quite a big achievement. You, you have to remember that our school is 380 students or so, maybe 250 families. And to host and stage an event for 8,000 people really shows the commitment of the school community as a whole, because it wouldn't be possible without parents, uh, students, staff engaging in that. And the, the um, um, outreach that we have here in our area, and it's, it's fantastic, unfortunately had to be canceled this year, but we're really looking forward to getting into more visible events. And, and they're not only important, of course, for, for you know, reaching out to the community, but also internally, and kids enjoy that, uh, as well as other events. And as I said, we want the parents to be involved in our school, not just uh, baking cakes and at the Barbie, but organizationally as well. We have a strong parent representative council, which is very important to us. Um, our board mostly consists of parents, and um, we want them, we want you, we want the parents to be engaged and, and have their views and, and be heard in our school and engage in, in different ways. Okay, that concludes this introductory talk. Uh, we'd really love to welcome you to our school community next year or maybe in 2022, depending on what your personal situation is, what your choices are at the moment. Um, and now I give back to hand back to Antje, who will explain to you a little bit about this slide and and uh, then start hosting the Q and A session. I'll leave that slide on for a second, Antje, so you can um, just introduce us to the rest of today's program. So thank you very much.
for now, and I'll be around for your questions in just a moment. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Let me read out this slide, which everyone else can read as well. So obviously we're gonna start with our Q&A session straight after, how are we doing for time actually? Oh, awesome, uh, right on time. Um, so we can continue straight away. And around 2.30, we're gonna um, start a second session. Basically, you can just stay online or rejoin if you feel, okay, you need to log off and you can come in again for a primary or preschool Q&A. Um, and please use the time now already to start asking your questions so I don't have to make questions up. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get this Q&A started. Please use the chat room for it. Um, coming back to the slide, um, the virtual school tours that we have previously recorded in May already for our previous virtual open day have been sent to you in the, um, in the email that you got with the Zoom link for today. And you can watch this at any time. And um, Another thing we like to offer is a trial day, um, usually for students that would like to start next year, or let's say for 2022, um, but the best time would be maybe in term one of 2021, if you are still unsure if this is the right school for them. If you're already pretty sure and you have sort of finalized the uh, enrollment, best would be to have a trial day in term four, so shortly before the students start, because that allows them to, um, to already meet half of the other students that will be with them in class. And in terms of the application deadline, basically applications aren't closed, but we are starting to approve applications generally in March of the prior year. Um, only for year seven, we've started two years in advance. So basically the applications for year seven in 2022, they have already started to be approved. So we already have the first students for year seven that are not currently at our school uh, enrolled, um, but the enrollments aren't closed yet. So, um, and I think that concludes this slide um lawrence oh thank you <laughs> thank you for sharing this so i think it yeah shall we leave it in the speaker view so that we see the person sort of popping up and um, i would start to read out some questions i can see one of our teachers have has joined us too um miss yona vinnie can you unmute yourself and say hello so that you pop up <laughs> I can. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So, Miss Vinnie is teaching German as a foreign language, and I've asked her to join here as I know that there are quite a few parents uh, registered who are interested in secondary school from year seven, and um, a lot of them have absolutely no prior German. And there might be questions for you, so I thought it would be great to have you here in the mix. So Happy to help. help. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we have a question which is not for secondary school, but I read it out anyway because it's good to get started. And uh, are there any waiting lists for kindergarten and primary? And we might just extend that for all the classes because that is always an interesting question for parents. And um, if that's okay, I answer it myself. <laughs> being the registrar and well they are for some classes waiting lists but they are not very long because we are a small school we have generally just one class in primary school and two classes from year seven onwards secondary school starts from year five for our school and uh, waiting lists for year five and six are therefore actually quite common because we only have one class and they are usually full um, and for kindergarten, well, we have to determine for next year, for instance, how many applications we are still going to get in basically a week's time, because after that we have to make a decision. At the moment, we have what it looks like one full kindergarten, which would be around 22 
hopefully not 24, but that's our maximum for student numbers in a class. Uh, students, and um, if we have more, we may consider having two classes. Um, but that's what we hope to find out in about a week's time. And just, um, if I may interrupt, um, just remember that if we should have a large kindergarten class, there will be two teachers in the classroom, I thought. Yeah, so just to accommodate for that number so that it doesn't sound scary. Okay, thank you. Can I read the next question? Also, I'm getting some signs here which I can't read. I'm sorry. Someone raised their hand. Just okay. Microphone. Yeah. Okay, someone raised their hand. Um, if you like to ask your question, I didn't see it because I was looking at other people. <laughs> um, then please unmute yourself and just ask your question. Um, Otherwise, I'm just going to read more questions out. Yeah. Okay. Another question is, is there a year 11 intake for students wanting to join in the final two years for the IB? And I'd like to hand that question to our IB coordinator and head of senior secondary. Ms. Annie, do you like to answer that? I know I can answer this. It's just a registrar question, but I think it's a nice IB question. Sure. Of course, there's a year 11 intake. Um, actually, I think for 2021, we currently have about eight students who are new um, going to be joining the GIS, and they've been confirmed to join the class that will be the graduating class of 2022. Um, we've still got a few more places for 21, and yeah, every year we have um, students join us from other schools for their diploma program. May, may I just throw another question uh, to you as well, um, Annie, as this is a, just a question I'm getting quite often and I have to admit I did have a couple of private tours this morning and I got this question as well. Um, basically, the, the question is, can you start year 11 after, just from scratch, coming outside from school without any German knowledge? Um, do yeah, absolutely, because we're a fully bilingual school um, and because the RB Diploma Program by default is a multilingual program, um, our school is, we're, we're lucky that we have both the language of instruction as English and also language of instruction as German, so that gives us a bonus there. But for students who don't speak any German, they can actually take German ab initio, which is beginner German, as their group two um, foreign language um, in the diploma, and then all the other subjects would be in English if, if that was their, their, their um, most comfortable language. Um, or they could do a combination, some subjects in English, some subjects in German, if they are German speakers, um, and then their second language in, in Spanish. So we have that capability there yeah, for sure. And if, and if students speak another completely different language as their mother tongue? As long as their um, level of English or German is, um, has reached the minimum requirement for accessing the learning. Because at the end of the day, they're still going to be studying, you know, university level um, in a lot of cases, science and humanities subjects in English or in German. So whichever language they would speak normally, their English or German language skills have to be able to access that learning. But we can also say they speak Russian at home. Um, that we can do, uh, we have a mother tongue language A school supported self taught um, option for literature studies in group one. So rather than doing English or German in group one, they could do Russian or Ukrainian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Dutch. These are all languages that we've currently got or have had in the last couple of years with students doing their mother tongue as their group one literature study. And then in group two, they do English B at high level. That means the Australian um, rule about having um, English B at at least high level. And then they might do German ab initio, or beginner German, as an alternative for their group six subject if they didn't want to do art or film. Okay, thank you, Annie. And I can't see another question, so I'm just going to go with some of the questions that I am being asked quite a bit. So I'm just going to use that until you have any questions. So, uh, which year level uh, do you recommend to join our school when a student doesn't know any 
German yet and they're interested in secondary school. Maybe Horst Kiesler, would you like to say something since you're unmuted? I'm just assuming. Yeah, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, we uh, very much welcome students with no prior knowledge in, in German in secondary school. And the best time to start at our school for kids like this are it or is the start of year seven, where we have not only a great intake, but also have got a program uh, starting in year seven, especially designed for students who begin to learn German. And that's why we strongly encourage people, if they intend to come to the school, to come in year seven, or if, or even earlier in primary or preschool or kindergarten. Thank you. Uh, now, another question I got this morning, in fact, was um, how much German is in the timetable? And uh, Ms. Vinya, I'm going to address you in a minute, so just so you get a little heads up. <laughs> uh, so how much German is there in a the timetable of a year seven student? And will my child feel like an outsider, like an alien <laughs> in a German school when they don't know any? Thank you. Yeah. So um, in year seven and year eight, uh, students will have nine periods a week of German. Um, so a period is 45 minutes at, uh, at our school in the secondary. Um, and that's weekly. So nine, nine periods a week, which is quite a lot, especially in comparison to other language programs. And then in addition to that, we have um, sport, art and music, which is uh, mainly taught in German as well. So they have a lot of input um, in the German language. And then in year nine and 10, this changes a little bit. So then they have five periods a week still of German language instruction. Yeah. And if they would feel like an alien? No, I don't think so. So at the moment we have almost 50-50% of students coming with um, prior no uh, knowledge in the German language in, in year seven. So I think that they would definitely not feel an, uh, as an alien. And in fact, we have a really, really broad diversity in cultural and language background of our students with uh, current year seven, for example, backgrounds in Italian and Dutch and Ukrainian and Hungarian and many other languages. Yeah. Yeah, I had this morning, I had a French speaker and I know we have a few French speakers at the school. Um, is it possible for a fluent French speaker to continue French in our school when they start in year seven without any German? Sorry. Oh, is that me too? <laughs> Why not? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so with French, we, we do offer French from year six onwards. Um, however, it's sort of um, on the German side of things. So if a student doesn't have prior German knowledge at all, it will probably be quite a challenge for them to follow the French classes, especially in the beginning where grammar, for example, might be explained in the German language. So um, it's something that we would have to look into at a very individual basis. But generally speaking, they should first concentrate on getting their German skills up. Thank you. I'm going to continue with your questions here of the Q&A. Thank you for actually asking questions. Um, so first question is, how many students are there in a class in junior high school, um, Mr. Giesler? Yeah, when it comes to years five and six, we have got something in between 20 and 24, sometimes 25 students. Uh, when it comes to year seven and the classes above year seven, it's mostly less than 20 students. Because we have two classes there. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. And uh, there's one question, how about Danish? Well, I know we don't teach Danish in junior secondary school, but maybe, um, Miss Annie, can you answer what can you do when you're Danish in the IB? Is it possible to do Danish? Yeah, of course, they can do Danish A literature as a self-taught, school-supported, uh, group one literature subject. And then if they did Danish A, they would then have to do English B at high level for their group two. And then they would be able to do German Abedicio as their elective in group six if they didn't want to do art or film. They could also, if 
perhaps they wanted to do art or film in their group six subject, or they might want to do a second science or a second humanities um, in their group six elective slot, then they could at least learn some German language skills as part of their CAS program. And they could even work towards their DSD1 certificate as a CAS project. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, does the nine hours, so that's uh, talking about German again, uh, does the nine hours we have mentioned, it, what is a mixture of subject thought in German or is it pure German language learning? Yes, yeah. I'll jump in on that one. Um, <laughs> so those nine hours are actually pure German language learning, which uh, we're quite proud about being able to offer. Yeah. So is it the support German language? So from what I have learned, please correct me, because <laughs> I'm learning from you. So it's five uh, normal lessons to learn German, and then it's four support lessons, right? So how does it work? Does the music teacher tell you what to teach? Or? Yeah, so basically we have um, five periods that are parallel to German as a mother tongue, and those five periods are pure German uh, language classes so like if you would do a German, German course outside of school as well and the other four periods are uh, basically there to support the students to be able to participate in German in music sports and art and so the German teachers who teach those classes are provided with topics from those uh, subject teachers so music art and sport um, and then fo focus on learning the most important vocabulary and phrases um, for those topics with the students. Okay, thank you. Since I don't see any more questions, unless please give me a sign I'm not reading at all. Um, uh, I have another a couple of questions prepared. Um, and another one is for the IB coordinator, Miss Annie. Um, a very often very very often asked question what are the differences between the hsc and the ib because obviously we don't offer the hsc and that's um, a good question yes you know have we got like two hours to answer that question <laughs> it's a really it's a really um in-depth question and you can find a lot of information about the hsc and what and how it's structured compared to the ib diploma and how it's structured um, on various websites, you can Google that. But in a nutshell, um, both programs are uh, recognised internationally. The HSC is recognised in a lot of places as an uh, international high school qualification, but it's not recognised in as many places, obviously, as the IP diploma because it's fully international. Um, also, the HSC might be recognised for some universities in Germany, for example, but not as many as the IB Diploma. And in fact, you can do the IB Diploma in a German approach called the GIB, which is the German IB. And that's actually created to meet most universities in Germany. So for our students who are aiming to head to Germany, um, the IB Diploma done in the German approach is definitely going to be far better than the HSC, obviously for university admission. Um, the other thing I would say is that the high school certificate in New South Wales has intentionally been created for all students to set them up for pathways into practical careers, trade careers, um, elite sports, sport programs, performing arts programs, and academic pathways into university. Um, so the HSC by default has got all of those options for students built in. Whereas the IB Diploma is very much a university preparation program. Um, if a student is not planning on going on to university to start their undergraduate degree um, upon graduating from the diploma, then it's kind of pointless doing the IB Diploma. The IB Diploma is a university preparation course. It doesn't really set kids up as well for practical trades and other courses like that. So parents really do need to have a look at the different pathways and the options and students really have to work out am I going to university? Am I taking an academic pathway? And if I am, then the IB diploma is probably a better fit. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, the next question I'm gonna hand actually to our principal. So just 
get ready. <laughs> I have to read all the questions out because the recording doesn't record the chat window, isn't it? So um, if a student transfers to another German school overseas, which is also part of the Deutsche Auslandschule, um, will the program by year be compatible, compatible <laughs> to the one at GITS? Yes. Uh, as I said before, there, there are about 140 uh, German schools internationally and, and I made the point that they differ uh, according to the nations and, and the educational uh, um, regulations, national regulations they have to adhere to. But I also said that uh, in all the German international schools, um, students will pass at the end of year 10 so-called Mittelstufenabschluss, so uh, um, junior school diploma. Um, which is centralized. So it comes from Germany and it's written in the same way all over the world. Um, and that, of course, means that all the build up for year 10 has to be comparable. So we have curricula here, yes, and they do um, have parts um, that, that are maybe a little bit of variation to, to the curricula elsewhere because we are in Australia and we have to stick with the Australian uh, curricula as well and integrate them, but uh, it's, it's very well comparable to what's happening in other German international schools. What is different is that we're obviously in the Southern Hemisphere, so um, it means uh, for the students coming to us from Europe, which happens a lot, um, they will either have to jump one half year forwards or backwards, and that happens of course again if someone would leave our school for the Northern Hemisphere, um, that's something that is then an individual decision for the parents and they will receive our counselling when kids come to us uh, from us looking at, at the history and the previous reports and um, you'll have to go from there so you have to make that decision but other than that um, we're as an international school it's our day-to-day -day business to facilitate um, kids from different countries coming into our school and leaving school um, if that is necessary due to relocations. Thank you. You've answered already the next question that I had ready for you because <laughs> it was relating to it. It made sense. Um, but another question that could come up, it's not just how, how it is to uh, transfer to a, another German school, but what if the student would like to actually transfer back to an Australian school, for instance, if they decide they don't want to do the IB, they want to do the HSC in year 11. Um, how easy is that, uh, Horst, if that's okay for you to answer? Yeah, that's okay. Well, the feedback we get from former students of us who, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, went to an Australian school is, is great, especially in the subjects like math and the sciences and the languages. That's where, where they have got uh, yeah, a bonus, an advantage. And that's the feedback we get from, from these kind of students when they move from our school uh, to Australian schools. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Okay, thank you. Um, I've, okay, <laughs> I'm getting signs here. Oh, there's a question. Why am I not seeing this by myself? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, if known, what is the average percentage of students going into universities in Germany, Austria, Switzerland after finishing the program at GIS? Any, that is definitely a question for you. Um, well, it kind of goes up and down depending on um, the cohort. I mean, some years we get um, quite a lot of students in the, in the graduating class who come from German families, for example, and they, then they head off back to Germany for university. And then other years, we might have more students in the class who come from Australian families and they're going to stay here for university. Um, and then some years we've got groups of uh, students who they might go to the UK or to North America or Singapore. So, um, you know, there's no kind of like what we couldn't really say, okay, this percentage every year go to Germany. That's kind of it's a little bit too diverse be able to nail it down to an exact percentage. It's different every year, but every year we have some students who graduate and then head back to Germany for university. Okay, thank 
Okay, thank you. I also had a question this morning. How about friends? Are there any going to friends? Someone asked me, so I might just throw it out here. We've had in the last two years, there's been someone applying to France. And actually what, we, what we've got at the moment, I'm counseling one of our students in our graduating class who's going to graduate in December. She's looking at a double degree with UCED, where she'll do a Bachelor of Laws with a Bachelor of um, Science Honours. Um, and she'll do that at Po University in Paris. So it's an agreement I have between UCED and Paris. So she'll do, um, I think, two years at UCED and two years in Paris. So that's a kind of combined program through University of Sydney. Uh, are there any particular conditions for students who would like to go, for instance, to France? Um, like, for instance, if you want to go to Germany, you have to have this and this amount of subjects on a higher level. Do you have any? Yeah, uh, there's, there's slightly different. On the one hand, the IB diploma is recognised pretty much everywhere without having too many um, restrictions or, you know, subsets of rules. Um, most, most countries accept the diploma just as it is. There are a couple of additional requirements for Germany, a couple of additional requirements for the Netherlands, um, maybe Switzerland. But for all of these different, uh, there's slightly different requirements, like whether they did maths at higher level or not, for example, which is pretty popular in Germany and the Netherlands and Switzerland. Um, you can find the up-to-date um, briefs on those university requirements on the IBO website. And you go into there and you look at university recognition, and you click on that link, and then there's up-to-date briefs on all the different countries that require, you know, small things to be adjusted in the diploma program for their university admission. Okay, well, thank you. Um, since I haven't got any other questions, I'm just going to go with the questions that I'm being asked uh, a lot. Um, yes, about our class teacher concept, um, Horst, maybe that might be a question. I think everyone can answer it, but I'm just picking Mr. Giesler, if that's okay. Um, can you please describe our class teacher system? So many of our classes have two class teachers. What does it mean? Not all of them, but. Yeah, uh, the idea uh, with our class teachers is, or class teacher concept is, that we have got two teachers for each class who are more or less in charge or responsible for the students. Uh, they are the persons of contact for the parents. They, uh, yeah, do the daily roll call. They are supposed to be very close with the students. And yeah, and uh, especially when it comes to dealing with parents and with other teachers, um, that's where yeah, where all the information comes together and they proactively get in touch with parents if they feel necessary. They organize class conferences where all teachers are uh, invited and discuss the situation in the class or discuss students of concern or whatever. And we are quite happy to have this kind of concept as it is, uh, uh, yeah, one of our pillars in the context of student well-being and it's working pretty good so far and uh, yeah that's something we definitely will keep on doing okay thanks very much um we've got another question here um and maybe that's also something for you um host i'm sorry um what extracurricular activities do we offer well uh, when it comes to the extracurricular um, activities um, you have to keep in mind we have got uh, two days where we offer these. It's a Tuesday and um, a Thursday. And on Tuesdays, it's from kindergarten to year four. And on a Thursday, it's again from kindergarten to year seven. And we offer a variety of activities, physical activities, um, musical activities. We have got a drama AG. It always changes a bit uh, if we get new teachers and they have got something to offer to the school, to the students, then we change the offer for the IG too. We also have got an offer for our year seven students. Uh, as you might know, we have got the policy that uh, the year seven students, or we start with the year seven students to bring their own uh, device, laptop device uh, to school, and they get special training uh, during uh, the IG time, the co-curricular activity time. And so, yes, it's a, quite a few activities we, are, uh, we offer, and it's a bit of a change, not every year, but uh, it depends on the 
the teachers, what kind of interests they bring to the school and what they are prepared to do with the kids. Sometimes the kids are quite proactive and uh, also uh, help to organize co-curricular activities. So it's a bit a give and take from everybody and it's a great source of entertainment for everybody. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, another question I get very often is about our mobile phone policy. And I know that Mr. Metzger can answer this really well. Is that okay for you to say something about our mobile phone policy? Um, I'm a bit surprised that this is a, a big concern, but uh, maybe that's just because uh, the waves have, have uh, come down in our school around this uh, over the last year or so. And it's just not a topic that much anymore. Uh, it is obviously very, very important for, for parents and, and students. Um, and let me maybe give you give a, a bit of a broader answer to this. So generally, when it comes to um, student behavior that is allowed on campus, um, of course, every school has their disciplinary policies and regimes. But our focus in this school is on behavior guidance. So we, rather than just um, if someone doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, comply with a, with a given rule, rather than just saying, okay, you did this or that, now this or that is the punishment. We really focus on educating the students to be responsible um, for themselves and for the other kids around them in the classroom or on the playground and take informed and responsible decisions. So um, behavior guidance is, is really something that is lived in, in school and in classroom. Uh, in terms of uh, mobiles, there is a, a broad uh, range of different views uh, among parents, among scientists, uh, among schools, and, and our rules are that, um, of course, we want to really um, build competencies and skills of students with IT and we invest a lot of money into that. Uh, we have the bring your own device policy from year seven but we also have tablets for the little ones in primary, we have smart screens in all the classrooms and so forth uh, and we want to build their competencies and that sometimes includes mobiles as well because they're a very useful app sometimes that you can use say in physics uh, or in sports or in other subjects um, and that can be integrated into the lesson. So we allow students to bring their mobiles to school. They have to be tucked away during um, lunch break, during morning tea break, when they're in public areas, because we want the students to socialize with others. Um, they have to be put away in the classroom, but they can be used where it makes sense. And that's what the teachers then allow them to do. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, it's kind of jumping here for me. I, I thought that maybe it's best for uh, Ms. Vinnie to answer that, but if someone else would like to jump in, please unmute yourself. It's about the percentage of German speakers in our junior secondary school. And I thought as a teacher um, who actually looks after all types of students in, in that part of the school, you might actually be, be able to answer that. With yeah, I saw the, I, thank you, I saw the question coming up, so I started counting in my head, <laughs> I, I, and I'm happy to be corrected, but I would say that in many classes, it's actually about half-half. Um, if I compare the students taking German as a, as a foreign language and students that do uh, take German as a mother tongue, I think it's pretty well balanced. Maybe it's 40, 60 in some years, but um, around 50%, I would say. And then we have some students that have been just for a very long time at mm. our school. They actually don't have German speaking parents, but they're already fluent. And then we have some who have German parents, but they haven't actually been growing up with the language. So yes. they stay. So it's a, it's a very gray zone, isn't it? It, it is indeed. And, it, and it's really interesting as well, because we often have students that have the cultural background of a German speaking country, but not necessarily the language competency yet to to go into mother tongue class so yeah so it's a big mix okay now so the next question i'm not supposed to okay. read okay. out so. kindy and primary was the same question but i'm afraid i can't answer that one 
for, for kindy and primary. I'd like to answer that sort of later when kindy and primary parents are there. It's actually, but I can say it shortly, it's, um, it's in kindy, the, the majority of kids actually start sort of with um, German as, their, as a foreign language, but then the, the later we get into primary, um, the more German speakers we end up having because there's also a lot of kids who have one German parent, but they don't speak any German when they start. So it's, uh, yeah, also very difficult to answer, actually. Now, I need to read that other question in time. So I, I'll just throw one of my questions out so I can read it <laughs> quietly. Um, yeah, uh, one Anke, can, I, can I just comment on, on the languages, just uh, sure. for everyone who, who hasn't been to our school and hasn't had the opportunity to see the school in, in, uh, in an open morning, live in action, and, and to watch the students in the playground. Um, the bottom line is they will pick up both languages. And um, it takes some time to do that for, and, and longer for some and shorter for some others. And the, the mix in the classes may differ a little bit. There may be some more German native speakers in one class and some more English native speakers in, in another. But if you watch them in the playground, um, both languages are lived in school, not just in class uh, in certain subjects. They're lived and, and embraced, and, and that is what makes the school unique and, and what sets up the students for, for really bilinguality. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, next, the next question uh, is about the uniforms, of course. I know it's your favorite question. Um, do, we, we have no uniforms. That's no secret. That would make no sense to, um, for me to ask that question. But maybe you could like to say something about the ongoing discussion about uniforms and dress code. Mm. No, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. We don't have a school uniform. That's uh, sometimes a bit hard for uh, our local parents to understand. Yes, there is a school with no uh, uniform and it's still a good school or that's at least what we believe um, yeah and as uh, most of you guys probably know there's no tradition in most of European countries having a school, school uniform and definitely not in Germany and uh, however we have got a dress code and um, yes um, and uh, teachers are prepared to give advice uh, it's an official dress code policy new parents will get this policy uh, new students will be advised what to wear. It's also pretty straightforward. However, if you have 10 to 8, some excitement in the year 8, 9, 10, or 11, 12. But all in all, it's working, and uh, there are no plans in the pipeline for getting a school uniform at the German school. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Now, there's a question. I believe it's been repeated but I'm not sure so I just answer it quickly in terms of how many students per year um, so basically the maximum for our school is 24 students occasionally there can be 25 that is the maximum allowed but if we have two classes like for year seven eight nine ten at the moment the overall number is probably more around 17 per class and then we have two classes i hope that answers the the question and mr giesler horse can i please pass the next question on to you as well is the curriculum in the later years similar to the one you would see in german schools such as realschule or gymnasium i know this is a very german question it's hard to understand for someone who's not familiar with the school system, but if you could shortly mention something about the uh, bin differential. Yeah, well, well, Lawrence already mentioned, uh, mentioned it, that we have got our own curriculum, the so-called GIS curriculum, which is partly German and partly Australian. Um, however, it's correct that for our so-called German students who probably plan to go back to Germany uh, sometime between year, year five or year 10 or after year 10, um, they get uh, they get labeled, uh, and that's pretty much uh, what happens in the German school system for secondary students, uh, Gymnasialschüler and Realschüler, and uh, that's what we are doing here, not after year four, but after year five, and um, yeah, but this is only happening to our so-called German students, and we have got the GIS curriculum, which is predominantly a German 
the gymnasial curriculum and the very few real children we have uh, um, will get differentiation and um, this most class we don't have even real schüler most of our students are either gymnasial schüler or they are our local students which don't have to be labeled and um, yes in the case we have real schüler local students and gymnasial schüler it's a job of the teachers to differentiate and again this is everyday work of our teacher and it's working well okay thank you one more one more comment regarding the not so much the curriculum, but rather the um, year 10 exam. So uh, for, for someone coming from Germany, um, the, the exam that we have at the end of year 10, if it's taken on gymnasium level, um, and as I said, it's standardized worldwide, it will allow the students, if they pass the exams, and pretty much everyone does that, to then go into the Qualifikationsphase in the Oberstufe in Deutschland which means into the final two years to be admitted to the final two years of school anywhere in Germany. So there's a certain, um, yeah, a, a certain step installed there that actually um, gives the students a right to, to enter the qualification mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to the, thank you, sorry. Uh, let's go back to the questions. Um, so one question here, and I hope it's okay. I take you again, Dr. Gisler. Um, would the time dedicated to English literature and language be different to the time spent at, in an Australian school in junior secondary? Well, uh, one of the reasons we have got no problems uh, with the New South Wales Education Authorities to get a, a, the approval here in New South Wales is we are teaching according in English, we are teaching according to the New, New South Wales curriculum. So hey, the amount of teaching and the quality of teaching, it, it's, by the way, it's done by native speakers, is more or less what, what is happening in Australian high schools too. And um, that is one a prerequisite for the New South Wales inspectors to give us actually the approval to be allowed to. Okay, thank you. We've got some technical difficulties here. I don't know if you noticed that, if there was any feedback. We can see a face now for the moderator. <laughs> Um, okay, there was uh, one private question which I, I like to answer um, differently, I'm not sure how yet, but um, hang on, there was one more question, <laughs> I saw it there, uh, right, I'll just ask another question in between, um, a question I get quite often, how can I help with homework if I'm a parent who doesn't speak any German? Was these lessons here unmuted? Oh, yeah. That's actually one of the uh, most popular questions from parents with no English or oh, with no German speaking background. Um, yes, it's actually working. Um, you probably need a bit more contact with the, with the, um, with the relevant teachers, but um, it's, it has proven that it is not a problem. In case you feel that uh, you should need some more information, we encourage these kind of parents to get in touch with the relevant teachers. This happens and that's okay. And um, yeah, but as I said, there's no great concern when it comes to homework and the families where nobody speaks um, the German. And another thing when we just talk about homework, um, we have got the school policy not to have too much homework because we know our kids are uh, extremely active after school let it be so, uh, let it be sports or music or whatever and they sometimes have a bit of a long commute from school uh, to home and that's why we have got this policy to um, yeah to, to, to not to come up with too much homework for the students however there is homework there are assignments and this is part of school life but again uh, we keep it to a minimum thank you very much um I have a quick question out of interest, if that's okay, that I just throw a question in, <laughs> and that is for Ms. Vinya. Um, I know that for language learning, there's usually a lot of homework because you have to learn <laughs> a lot of vocabulary. And if we have French, Spanish, German, how much homework is there for German? Yeah, for German as a second language or a foreign language, I should say. Um, as 
I would say, generally speaking, of course, there can be other times of the year as well where there is more homework. But basically what we expect students to do is to practice uh, focused vocabulary at home, because that is something that you can really only do by practicing, practicing and practicing. And so typically a student might get 20, 25 words in a week that uh, tie in with the topic that we are currently covering. And the teachers would expect the students to learn these uh, words well, both the meaning and spelling and any special grammar that needs to be known with it and do that at home. And ideally a student would use maybe 10 to 15 minutes every day to practice those words. And that would be the main bulk of homework that we give out. Okay. And uh, one of the private questions I've received here is about the teaching methods. Um, is there something that you can say about the teaching methods of learning German? Hmm. Yes. Um, so again, we um, focus on a communicative approach, which means that we really want students to be able to communicate in the language as quickly as possible. That means focus is not on getting every single piece of grammar correctly before you are encouraged to start speaking or writing in the language. Um, so this means that we speak a lot of German in the classes and usually in the first couple of weeks students are quite um, overwhelmed by the amount of German that they hear and they sometimes think that they are supposed to know the language before they come but that is not at all um, why we do it but rather so that they get used to hearing the language quickly and used to um, finding techniques and strategies to understand even though they don't understand everything. So focus on communication. Okay, thank you. Uh, another part of that private message was about the qualification of teachers. I'm not sure if that's just for the German teachers or for all the teachers, but maybe I'd like to maybe pass that on to Mr. Metzger about the qualification of our teachers. Can you, is that a very broad question or is that okay? So maybe I can uh, give two perspectives on that. One is the formal perspective. Um, I don't know where the question comes from, from an Australian parent or from a German parent. So in New South Wales, all the teachers have to be registered uh, by an organization called NESA. And in order to be registered, they have to prove their university qualifications and their teaching qualifications. Um, all of our teachers are really well qualified coming from different countries and different educational backgrounds, but they all have studied years at the university and they have practice in school and they, most of them have a, a on in school training in, in uh, Germany which is called Referendariat. So they're very well qualified and they keep on qualifying through an elaborate program of, of PDs that everyone, every teacher has to do in New South Wales. The other side of the perspective is, is um, of course the individual um, yeah, approach to teaching, learning, the outreach and the qualification and um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's hard to, to, to generalize that and, and to, uh, yeah, to give the full picture, but I, I'm really enthusiastic about our staff here. And as an example, um, I can speak about um, what we achieved in our lockdown phase um, in April, May of this year. And I think it was amazing how the school as a whole, as an organization, but also the teachers embraced the new challenges that we had at that time. Um, uh, their IT skills um, are fantastic, I think, compared to many other schools, and uh, how they reached out to students in a very, very difficult situation with a lot of engagement, a lot of prof professionality, and I'm really proud of that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is probably sort of a combined question for Mr. Giesler as well as for Ms. Vignier. I'm sorry, <laughs> you probably have to just pass over to each other. Um, so the question is, is it common for senior high school students to do one exchange year at a gymnasium in Germany? Gymnasium is a, is a type of school in Germany. It's not the sports hall. Um, and then 
continue at GIS in Sydney. And the second part of the question is what year does Spanish start and does it continue all the way to year 12? So Ms. Vigny, you know which part is your question? <laughs> um, yeah, Mr. Giesler, do you mind yeah, answering I'm, the exchange? I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, it's actually continue all the way to year 12. However, uh, keep in mind, we have got quite a few uh, students and families uh, at our school who have got connections to Germany. They are fully, uh, what is it, fully Australians, uh, by nationals, uh, still with close links to Germany. And we encourage actually these uh, children to go to Germany if they want to, to visit their, their uh, relatives and sometimes stay there for half a year, sometimes even for a year to improve their German, to see the German school system, to do a bit of a family review, reunion, and we are happy to take them back after this half year uh, semester, or even if, if it's a year. And uh, as I said, we are strongly encouraging parents who have got ideas in this direction. And we have got an exchange program, and that's where Jana comes in, uh, for our students who started our school learning German, and um, Jana, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Horst. <laughs> yes, um, indeed. So every second year we take a group of students to Germany for an exchange. And this is a voluntary exchange um, for students in year 9 and 10 we take. Um, and we stay in Germany for about three weeks and one week, give or take a few days, is spent at a German gymnasium. Um, and we stay in host families during that week. And it's actually quite common that students come along and travel with us for the three weeks, but then end up staying for longer. And that period could be another couple of weeks, but also a full term or even longer than that. So that's quite common as well. Mm. And now the Spanish question, please. Yes. <laughs> Since you're the Spanish teacher too. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, Spanish is offered in year 9 and 10 for students who are not taking French, I must say. So if a student comes from Germany and uh, is aiming for a gymnasial abschluss, um, then they do have to continue with French if that's what they've been doing in Germany. So in year 9 and 10, we um, have Spanish for the students who are learning German as well. And that's uh, four periods a week in year nine and three periods a week in year 10. And then they can choose to continue with Spanish in the IB if they like to. Thank you. Now the next question, I'm struggling a little bit to understand it. So I hope that maybe Mr. Metzger can understand. If not, then I would like to ask Hank to maybe specify the question. Um, so is the school's orientation humanistic or scientific? Would you know how to answer that, Mr. Metzger? Sorry. I think humanistic, uh, the humanistic approach to um, education is something that is probably shared by almost everyone in a certain sense. Um, and that's a foundation of, of like a philosophical foundation of, of uh, education. Uh, that's, that's shared by many. Um, if, you, if your question is related to the humanities as subjects, I would say that um, we're more leaning towards science um, in, in terms of uh, biology, physics, chemistry, plus maths, obviously. Um, subjects that we offer throughout junior secondary school, but also um, as elective subjects and math is a mandatory subject in the IB. Um, whereas uh, subjects like social studies and histories and economics uh, are also very important in our school. And we do things like, uh, for example, um, uh, an MMUN program in, in junior secondary. Um, it's called Montessori Model United Nations, where in addition to the regular classes in, in the humanities, um, students who elect that can participate in a program with students worldwide, which will culminate in a meeting in New York in, in the actual UN assembly, uh, and students coming together from various parts of the world. So we have a lot of activities around politics, economics, 
social studies, um, uh, history. We have um, practicals where the students uh, go into companies and, and are supported there as well. So um, yeah, I would say generally leaning a bit towards science, but humanities play an important role as well. Okay, thank you very much. So the next two questions, I'm just going to read them out. And um, for everyone here from our staff members, if you mute yourself, that gives me a sign that you don't want to answer that. And if no one wants to answer it, I answer it, okay? Okay. <laughs> so has the current setup for Wi-Fi connection in the preschool and the schools? Uh, had, sorry, I'm not good at reading. Is Wi-Fi enabled everywhere, basically? And uh, what's the current setup for Wi-Fi connection in a preschool and a school? So that's basically the same question. Sorry, I'm gonna have to scroll here. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Now it's getting complicated. Further, the school is located in the area close to the Cherry Hills Meteorological Radar, as well as the Octa Satellite Earth Station Control Center in Belrose, which may potentially emit powerful fields reaching the campus. Have any studies been performed about the radio frequency radiation safety on campus? Um, yeah, Mr. Metzger, okay. you are <laughs> unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> Well, to address the second question uh, first, I'm not aware that, uh, I've never received any information that a specific risk would, could be uh, um, uh, related to those stations and um, it hasn't been assessed, not, that's not that I'm aware of. Um, to the first question, uh, Wi-Fi is available on our whole campus. And it is an integrated part of teaching and learning that children can use the tablets in primary, the, their own devices in secondary, all over the campus, including the library, all the classrooms, even the sports hall. And um, we have all teachers have their own uh, laptops which they bring into the classroom, and we have smart screens everywhere. Just an, a standard modern um, approach. Um, with the, what was the, the on, what, was, what, what was the question related to? Yeah, and, and of course the, um, if it's, if it's being used and to what extent is it actually being used in the classroom, that, that's up to the teachers. Um, we have our old school network in which the students can log into, and that of course has a wet filter that, um, that, um, tries to to secure child protection and we have our own school network with uh, with certain white lists and black lists um, that, that make surfing the internet safer and in a public internet yeah. if if I may jump in we did have a parent recently um, coming to measure that because she was also concerned about it and I also when she was there, I was walking along and uh, one of our other physics teachers, so that's why I thought you actually knew about this. Mm -hmm. um, one, so basically in physics, there has been uh, done an experiment by some of the students and they have measured the Wi-Fi radiation, basically. So yes, I also learned that the Wi-Fi can't be uh, disabled. So it's, it is enabled everywhere. And so basically this uh, one mother, she, she measured the Wi-Fi and um, we actually found out that um, there is more signal or strength um, to be seen outside when there is a direct line to that tower that's been mentioned there than in the classrooms. But yeah, well, it's not scientifically proven according to the official websites that they are doing any harm, but uh, we, we have actually had sort of experiments measuring uh, the, the strength basically of the Wi-Fi radiation. I'm not so sure about the terminology, um, but yes, that tower obviously that, that there, is, there, there is a bit of a strong signal there. In how much that is harmful, we don't know because it's not really, we, we haven't been given any proven um, information about that. So uh, let me just 
continue. Um, there was one more. I guess, yeah, it's really difficult for me to scroll here. So the, just a clarification, we have to actually come to an end for this um, q and I'm being given signs here. Uh, so from Hank again, humanistic was more towards language, scientific, more towards language, scientific, more towards STEM. Might be from the time when I went to school and we had two different gymnasiums in town, uh, but it answered his question, so thank you. Okay, um, so maybe we, we end the official Q&A for the junior secondary here as we sort of came to, uh, it's 2.30 now and um, I can see that our head of um, preschool, Silke Bete, Bete, has logged in and also our um, head of primary school, Mr. Clemens Pedanik has logged in as well. Um, actually, can you two maybe unmute yourself and say hello so that for those people who are in speaker mode, they can actually see you? Clemens Pedanik? Hello. 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 My name is Clemens Pedanik. I'm the head of primary school. And yeah, I'm looking forward to this Q&A session and I'm happy to answer all the questions. Okay. And Silke, Bitke, can you say hello? Sorry. Hello everyone, I'm ready to hopefully be able to ask all the questions you have in regard to preschool and in Germany that would be kindergarten. Okay, thank you. And in case uh, we have some parents now leaving us because I believe the majority of um, parents would have had an interest in junior secondary, I have to say bye to if, if you don't like to stay locked in, please contact us by email if you have any more questions or particular questions in regards to the registration. Oh yeah, one quick thing I'd like to throw in, there was a question I received this morning by email and that it seems to be unclear uh, what a semester is in our school fees. We have our school fees per semester, that is half a year. So two terms are in one semester and that's half a year. Um, yeah. So I'll say goodbye to those who are no longer interested in primary and secondary, uh, primary school and in preschool. And thank you to Mr. Horst Giesler, our vice, no, deputy principal, and to Thomas Charthoff, our head of junior secondary, and to Ms. Vinier, who is teaching German and Spanish in junior secondary and uh, to Ms. Thompson. There's actually no particular order, right? <laughs> I'm saying thank you too. <laughs> so to Ms. Thompson, our head of senior secondary, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm not so sure if Mr. Metzger would like to stay or if he likes to go. Thank you anyway for joining. And- uh, I'll stay I'll... on, thanks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, no one needs to leave us, but in case you wish to. <laughs> Okay, so I have a question here, which is great. Um, my son will be five years old, early January 2022, and I'd love to start him at kindy in 2022. When will his enrollment be confirmed? I'm just, well, I, I am just answering this myself. Or oh, Mr. Pedanik, would you like to? Well, um, I think about the confirmation of enrollment, you would be the better person to ask All about right, that. okay then. <laughs> so if, if we already have the application in by uh, March 2021, fairly soon actually, well, it feels to me anyway, um, that, that would be the time when we start approving applications. It, it does help to have the application in a little bit earlier for our helping and also the longer you are in the wait list, the, the more likely we, we can't really say no because we, we, are, we need to start planning early. We have um, quite a few children coming from preschool and our preschoolers have basically guaranteed entry into kindy and then we have to see how much space there is left in the class if we only have one class. If we have more applications, then we may even consider having two classes. Is that? There's another, I, yeah. There's another question for starting kindy next year in, two, in 2021. 
Yes, that's an interesting question. Um, are there still places for kindy starting 2021? We're actually hoping to find today the, the remaining parents who are interested in that because it looks like as if we are already pretty full. And before we make the decision to close the class and just have one class, we would like to know if there's anyone else who's interested so that we can potentially cater for your children and potentially have a second class for kindy. Is that right, Mr. Pedanik? That's correct. Yeah, we are in the process of uh, finding out whether, as you said, whether we close uh, further applications and uh, continue with one class, uh, one kindergarten class in 2021, or if there are enough uh, uh, further applications to consider a second class. Yeah. So, uh, Katja, I would really like to encourage you to get in touch with me within the week, if that's okay, because we, we will have a, a meeting about this at the end of next week. Um, so, I'm just going to go to the next question. If there are two kindy classes, would there be one with kids that already speak German and the other one with new German learning kids, or would the classes be mixed? Mr. Pedanik? So definitely the classes will be mixed. That's our uh, uh, practice uh, um, that we have in kindergarten classes. We always look that we have the similar amount of strong German speaking students and uh, basically uh, learning, learners and new students. So we carefully uh, figure out uh, um, to fill the classes, but there is not a German stream class or an English stream class. We never do that. Thank that you. If, if I may comment on that, that's that's an overarching motive for the whole school, obviously. So wherever we have two classes, not just in kindy, all through primary, all through secondary, wherever wherever we have to, two classes, we try to mix the class as well in order to uh, yeah give give the students a, a rich learning environment and, and personal environment in which they can develop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as we currently have no other questions here, um, I would like to ask Mr. Pedanik, please, um, in the presentation earlier with Mr. Metzger, it might have been a little bit misleading about our class teacher concept in primary school. Could you please give an explanation about um, our class teacher concept? Yeah, we uh, in the tours that I had this morning, this question has been, uh, asked several times. So this is uh, really a, um, um, a strong feature at our school. I, I, I think uh, we try to have class teachers that uh, go with the class for more than just one year if possible. So we are looking for that, especially from kindergarten to year two, so that there is one team of uh, class teachers that go with the class and it's always a German speaking uh, main uh, classroom teacher that teaches most of the subjects like German, math, Sachunterricht, which is general studies, and if possible, art, music, uh, and sport as well. And then we have the English teacher. If possible, that's uh, the best combination. Sometimes, due to staffing, uh, staffing is issues, that's not always possible. We have the English teacher in the class as a team. They both lead the class. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I just noticed that I've actually missed a question earlier. Sorry, Anna, I didn't read that question. Um, so I'm just going to read it out now. So I hope that wasn't so relevant for um, the junior secondary parents. Um, so it's a question about safety and security. So Please, whoever would like to answer that, unmute yourself. I'm just going to read it out now. Um, is there CCTV video monitoring enabled on campus and any restricted access to the buildings? Um, how is children's communication on campus? How is it monitored and controlled, including possible interaction with externals? Well, Mr. Pedanik, you're unmuted. I am unmuted. I'm always unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we we do have um, CCTV cameras in the uh, for all entrance areas. So this um, area is monitored by cameras. 
uh, in regards to external per, uh, personal or per external people coming on campus, um, they are um, prompted towards the reception where they have to sign in. Um, if, um, if that is the concern and the question, and of course we continuously uh, have conversations with the students starting in kindergarten, uh, which areas they are allowed to and which areas they are not allowed to, uh, let's say during recess or during um, uh, lunch time. There are areas that are more for senior kids, for senior students, and areas that are um, especially open for primary students, like the jungle gym or the sand pit for primary students, if that is the concern in the question. Yeah, um, I, I'm not entirely sure about the, um, what the main concern is either. Well, I know we don't record children's communication. Uh, we have teachers on duty during, uh, during the lunch breaks. Would you like to say anything about the duty? Yeah, yeah we have several areas where the students are allowed during lunchtime. Um, there is one area that specifically for primary students, um, as we um, found out that especially new students in kindy year one, the younger students, um, they prefer to stay on campus one and not have uh, the, the, the fast paced uh, lunch activities of uh, senior students at the same time. So, so uh, and there are um, super, supervising teachers in primary campus, for example, we have one that is uh, supervising the jungle gym and the sand pit and this area and another one that has a, a, another area to supervise and they are constantly interacting with each other. So uh, all the way towards the campus too, that which is the senior campus or the sports field. So uh, during uh, lunchtime for our uh, whole campus area, we have four people on supervision duty. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question here. What are the school hours for kindy and is there after school care available? The that? school hours for kindy are the same practically as for the rest of the school. Uh, there is only one exception um, for the, uh, for the um, ex uh, co curricular activities. Um, uh, parents um, have the opportunity to uh, opt out until uh, uh, year two. So if they decide, no, um, it is too much for my child, then for example, on Tuesday, they can decide, I will pick up my child at one o'clock uh, at the start of lunchtime. Um, and that, but that can change for the next semester. Uh, but um, normally it's the same school hours and that's, it starts at 8.40, in the morning and finishes at 3.15 in the afternoon. Would you like me to take over with the after school care question? I think you would be the better person. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, we don't have after school care at our school premises, but we are using an external provider called Extent. And basically this provider offers after school care in a nearby school and our and we have one particular bus that takes the students there so the after-school care provider tells us who these children are and uh, our bus driver basically takes the children over and the parents pick the children up from after-school care in Belrose um, and uh, yeah that's a, quite a few kidney kids actually uh, use that service at the moment and uh, yeah and then there's also some after school sort of sport activities that are being offered here at the school but not by the school so for instance soccer um, and taekwondo are um, the sort of more common activities there's also one of the tennis clubs that comes here with a minivan and collects the children that are booked into the tennis activity um, but all of that has to be booked basically by the parents with the external provider and not with the school. But the parents let the class teachers know so that the class teachers um, are aware where the children are going after school. In particular, in the first year in kidney class, it's important that the class teacher is informed uh, to, and that the class teacher can make sure that the kid is going in the right direction basically after school. Uh, the next question is actually for Zuka. Um, 
how many kids are usually in the senior preschool classes that would mostly all continue kindy? Um, we have we very deliberately have a mixed age flexibility group so that we have children rate in age range from three years of age until five years of age. In the year they turn six, they have to be officially enrolled at primary school, so in kindy. So what we actually do, all the children who are at preschool who turn five till the end of January will move on to kindy. And as Antje previously has already mentioned, they have an automatic, they have a reserved spot. So they once they start at preschool, they will automatically go on to kindergarten. Um, if children are very advanced in their development, um, parents can also apply for an early school entry if their child turns five until the end of June. Um, but the number of children, how many that is, that varies every year, depends on enrollment. We are licensed to have 39 children per day on our current premises due to the outside play area and the indoor area. Um, so it, it varies every year. Some, in some years we have more older children, some years there are more younger children. It's, but generally it's about 20, 20 to 25 children who would usually move up. Is that right, Clement? Sometimes less, sometimes more? That's correct, yeah. It always depends on the year. It's more or less. Yeah. More or less. Um, I think what would really tie in well here with this question is if you could say something about the transition to kindy program, Silke. Yeah, um, it's quite intensive because we're fortunate enough to be on one premises. Not many preschools have that opportunity. So it usually starts in term three that we collaborate with the primary school teachers and uh, assess the children the primary school teachers come into the preschool rooms get to know the children uh, the preschool children actually visit children in classes there's a buddy system where all the students uh, meet one of the preschoolers as a buddy to, to help them adjust in school life and we have one preschool teacher who will go on to kindergarten together with that group of children this ensures continuity in, in program delivery, but also that they have a familiar person with them. Uh, and they stay for one or two terms with that class until uh, they, and then they go back to preschool. So there will be a primary school teacher that takes on the class as well as a preschool teacher for the first couple of terms so that they have someone familiar. And it's not just nice for the children, uh, but we found that also many parents appreciate that they already know one of the teachers and have a bond with them that helps with the transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let me read out the next question, even though half of that I can answer myself. Um, can the enrollment into preschool this year be performed immediately or is there any waiting time? Um, let me answer this one first. Um, it can it could be done immediately if you apply, but we actually don't have space in our three-day group at the moment. Um, our three-day group is from Monday to Wednesday and our two-day group Thursday to Friday, although it is much better for the student to the, for the children to be there more days. Um, unfortunately, we've got no space in the Monday to Wednesday group for this year anymore. So um, if, if you were interested in that group, you, your child would have to go on the wait list but then again it would be very useful to have the application or to be on the wait list as early as possible because otherwise we have well we are already having the problem at the beginning of next year um, but as soon as the space gets um, becomes available your child could have it so it's it really helps to be on the wait list and to answer the next question, um, is there any homework in preschool, kindy, and the primary school? And if yes, is it paper-based or online? Uh, Silke, are you okay if I answer that for preschool? Yeah. Very much. yeah, there is no homework in preschool at all, right? <laughs> so it's a play-based uh, yeah. environment. We base our work on the earliest learning framework for Australia, which very deliberately is a play-based curriculum so there's no homework as such in preschool and Clements how is that for primary school in primary school we don't have homework as in a traditional way of course there are spelling um, uh, lists that uh, are um, taken home in either in English or in German or reading tasks reading books so we deliberately encourage the students to take home uh, uh, books from the library 
and they and incorporate that in our uh, teaching and learning. Um, so um, no, there is no homework. Per se. Sometimes there are tasks to complete if they had a longer period uh, where they missed some uh, some days at school. So, but that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. Number one homework that I've learned as a parent is reading <laughs> at home from a real book. <laughs> and yes, if there's anything, it would be paper-based, right? When do we start anything online, Mr. Pedanik? Well, in primary school, you mean uh, in regards to homework? Yeah, in regards, I think that Anna is very much interested in um, anything done yeah, electronically. Yeah, I can say from my own experience, I'm a class teacher of year four. So when the students started to work on their own projects, for example, they uh, each of the students in, in term two, they picked their own uh, Southeast Asian country to explore uh, traditions and music and, and uh, different aspects of the country they had to create their own team on MS Teams, which is the platform that we use, so they could continue collaboratively to work at home um, and uh, continue working during the um, library lessons or HABE, which is homework lessons at school um, independently. So, that, so that's where we use uh, online tools for collaborative learning. And this is what we've just started this year because of COVID, or is this exactly? Yeah. We made a huge leap due to COVID. <laughs> it's not homework in the traditional sense, but we do encourage parents as well to read books with children at home. We do a lot of that, so that's a really important aspect of it. But we don't consider it homework. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't really see another question unless um, you can see. It. Okay. Because quite often I'm missing. Oh, there is one? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. If we are placed on a waiting list for three to five days per week in a preschool, shall we generally expect to start in this mode sometimes in February or earlier? Sorry. Um, yeah, so if, if, if you apply for the, year, for the three or five day group for this year you'll be placed automatically on a wait list if i have a space i will notify you straight you straight away um, and if you had applied for next year that would be the same thing so right now i don't really have a space in the year three uh, in the three day group um, but it is i can still see that maybe some of the students might actually uh, transition early and and then we may have some spaces in, in preschool, but I don't have that right now. But when I see that I do have the space, I will notify you straight away. I hope that answers the question. Um, Suka, if you miss, if you think I miss, no, no, I don't interpret it. Then. Yeah, it's availability that's the issue. If we have um, yeah. spaces available, we take everyone in even spontaneously but at the moment it's sadly not possible yeah but if you're on the wait list i would always go and who's longer on the wait list the only the only sort of students who would sort of jump the queue are siblings yeah. they have the highest priority at our school yeah so, sorry the two-day group is available at it, as i mentioned yeah but it's not everyone has time thursday friday but yeah, that's also an option to start and then you could actually um, sort of up the attendance later on. So therefore your child would already be included. I'm yeah. not sure all the child is, but if, if it's just the two days that are available and you already know that you want your child to start kindy, uh, I would recommend that you do that because that way the child gets to meet the other children that will go on to kindy with them so they can already form friendships and bonds and they can take part of the transition that they visit the teachers, they get to know the classrooms and um, all, all sorts of things. So if you have a child that is supposed to start kindy next year and you have the option to send them for two days, even if it's just the last term, it does help the child. Um, I can't really see another question right now, so I'm just going to go with my sort of frequently asked questions, if that's okay. Um, 
Yeah, so one of the very frequently asked questions for, for preschool is if it is possible to claim childcare subsidy. And yeah. So and it's, yeah, we are licensed as a school based preschool service, so that's more in education, not long daycare. And therefore, the, the subsidy, which is now, it's now called the childcare subsidy, doesn't apply. And um, for working parents, for instance, but the school fees are, for preschool are usually lower than long daycare, which is nearly double the price due to the long opening hours that they have staff on roster and provide meals. So, so it makes quite a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question completely unrelated to childcare subsidy. Does the child have to be toilet trained? Yes, <laughs> because if um, we have younger children who are, um, who are not toilet trained, we who are still in nappies, we, we would need separate nappy change facilities. We need different staff ratios and that's the requirement. That's why preschool starts for children from three years of age. However, it is um, quite common that we have children who are just have just been toilet trained, they might have the occasional accident. That's not a problem. The parents usually bring spare clothing for, and we help the children get changed. Um, so that's not really an issue. They just can't come wearing nappies. That's due to hygienic reasons and staffing reasons and building requirements that will be needed. So, the, and pull ups are considered nappies too. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, sorry, I'm. Oh. All oh, right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for giving me <laughs> science. Uh, will there be morning tea and lunch provided by the school? Um, I can maybe answer that. Well, I, just, I start and then you can continue. Uh, we, don't, we don't provide morning tea and lunch. Uh, a lot of parents pack morning tea and lunch for the children. And maybe Asilka, can you say a bit more about the kiosk and also what, what options are there yeah. in terms of storage? So the majority of preschool children bring their own morning tea and lunch. Uh, we can't warm it up because we're not a food handling business, but um, we have a refrigerator, so we refrigerate anything that needs to be refrigerated. Uh, morning tea is progressive, but we have lunch at the same time. And now that the school has a kiosk, parents can, of preschool children can also order our meals by the kiosk. The children don't have to go there and pick it up. They, we will arrange pick up. So there's always a teacher who will come and go and get the food for the children. Okay, and, um, so if a child can read and write basic words, count up to 100, as well as do basic maths, addition, subtraction, and so on, at the age of three, but in English, not in German, might an early transition to kindy at the age of four be possible, provided that the child catches up with the basic German within the next month after starting in preschool? Um, um, if the child turns five until the end of June, they can apply for early school entry, but school readiness is, is not really just the ability to read uh, basic words um, or to count up to a certain number. Because with early numeracy, it's not just about the counting, it's they have to understand the concept that a certain specific number stands for a value. So there's more to them. They need to have some kind of level of abstraction that they can follow that. And another really important part of school readiness, and that's something we focus a lot on at, at preschool, is the social and emotional aspect of the children. Um, so that's, I would say, even more important than the ability to, to um, be able to read a few words. Uh, they have to be confident enough, independent enough to organize their, their own belongings. They have to ask, be able to ask for help have some kind of a certain level of maturity and with these children for an early school entry they they are assessed by one of maybe Clemens can elaborate a bit more on that by we have a, a specially trained qualified primary school teacher who comes into preschool to work with the children and to see what level they're at in these areas as well so there are lots of factors that come into play school readiness is not just the academic side of it it's, it's a more holistic approach Clemens yeah that's correct I uh, just can uh, explain a little bit about um, our learning diversity teacher who comes to the preschool. I think at the moment she comes once a week to the preschool um, and assesses uh, mainly but not only the students uh, whose parents have applied for early entry. But as Silke said at the beginning, this, um, we only allow this application for early entry if the student would turn five until the end of June. 
um, otherwise uh, we couldn't we cannot accept any early entry uh, into primary school so we also do have for those students who um, are on the list for early entry to the school uh, we have um, orientation days organized or we will or, uh, organize orientation days in November where we invite all the students who are um, from who are um, um, enrolled for kindy next year we have two mornings where we see all of the students including the um, students for early entry so uh, there is a, um, a very intensive and rigorous uh, evaluation process to find out whether a student is ready and I agree with Silke it is not only about um, read, um, if the student can read and write certain words or count it is about um, a higher thinking skills concepts and it's about abstract thinking as well and mainly and one of our main focuses if they are ready socially emotionally that's very important okay thank you um so if the child thank you anna by the way for all the, your questions this is really helpful um i just have to always is that the beginning of the question? Sorry. <laughs> um, if the child does not turn five in the school year before 30th June, he she cannot be transitioned to pre to, to the kindergarten, pre probably. To kindergarten, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if mature enough, correct? Yes, yes correct. that's correct. Yeah. Cannot, yeah. Yeah. Or is there an assessment for possible transition in such a case as well? If the child no. is still four? No. No, no, that's not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, not at our school. There, there might, I, I don't know if there's other schools that consider that, but definitely not at our school. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm not sure if Anna or anyone else has any other question. There is one question that's also being asked quite often, and that is, might be also a question that's half for Zulka, half for Clemens, depending on the age of the child. How long will it take for my child who doesn't speak any German and who starts in preschool or in kindy um, to learn German? Zulka. Yeah, it varies, of course. It depends on a lot of factors. One of them is the exposure. They have to be exposed to the language for quite some time before they actually and they start taking it in receptively first before they actively start using the language. So that's one really important factor. Uh, another is also how interested the child is. And that's why we also have the approach to use the lang language a lot in meaningful context, very deliberately. We model the language here um, in authentic um, context so that the children make a connection. It becomes meaningful to them. It has a purpose for them. That helps with language learning. Often I get asked, um, there might be children who have a language delay or a speech problem, whether that's harder for those children, but I find even they pick it up like they would pick a mother tongue if they're sufficiently exposed to it. And often these children don't mind being in a multicultural or in a bilingual environment anyway, because that's not their strong point. They don't rely on language that much and just pick it up. Where sometimes there are families who send children here because they're really really good language wise in one language and these children might be a bit reluctant to speak at first and they, because you take their strength away so they don't have that motivation to to just try it out and be immersed in that language so it depends on the interest of the child the exposure they have had and how how much it's been encouraged and supported everywhere mm -hmm. yeah i, I agree and um, uh, this exposure and this immersion into the language that continues in primary school. So uh, the main uh, classroom language uh, modeled by the teachers, of course, is German, except for, for the English lessons. Um, but it, as Silke said, it depends on the interest of the child, it depends on, on, on whether the child is reluctant or not. Um, it is difficult to say after two years they can transition to the mainstream German um, uh, classes. It's difficult to say, but generally it is the earlier they join the school, in preschool or in kindy, uh, the easier it is the transition is because a lot of additional things um, uh, happen later on. Then there's 
and another uh, or there's more concepts to learn in math and in different subjects so the earlier the better and we had students who easily transitioned from uh, German as an additional language to the mainstream language course starting in kindergarten or who were in our preschool after a year and a half but sometimes it takes two years or two and a half years there's no way to say it takes this long so it depends on the on the child and on the environment I might also add that it helps if children come five days per week if there is availability because of course that way they have a lot more exposure and not just because hour wise they have more hours being immersed in the language it's also that the children who come five days usually settle in quicker bond with us more easily and are more yeah it's easier for them to pick it up in, in that way um, when we have children who come only two days per week, they have less exposure. It takes longer before they familiarize themselves and before they're more comfortable with using the language. So it does help the more days they have at preschool, the better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's, so there's a third part to the question. If, you, if we would like to accelerate the language acquisition process during the preschool time, can the school offer any extra activities such as one-on-one -on -one tutoring after hours in the preschool it's not no we don't have the tutoring hours for language but what some families do uh, that they have a german speaking au pair for instance that uh, comes to them that it deliberately speaks german to encourage the language learning even further or sometimes families get together when once they start at preschool they form they have find friends that they have play dates outside of school and so that the children have more opportunity to immerse in the additional language so that happens as well okay i know that we've got something in in primary school right clemens Agi. yeah we do have so in primary school um if a, if a child just started and has no prior uh, knowledge in German, we do the same thing for English as well, uh, then instead of picking uh, an uh, extra or co-curricular activity on one of the two days, uh, we offer um, language, a language intense play-based activity afternoon for those students. So that's what, but that's, that's, um, uh, that's the normality for students who come here and have no prior knowledge to the language. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Um, I can't see any other question for now, so I, I have, I'm asking now my last one. <laughs> so maybe there's another one coming in the meantime, or maybe we have to end this Q&A. Um, basically, one of the questions, well, one of the most common questions I get is, how, if, if a child doesn't speak any German, until what year level in primary school, Clemens, um, can the child enroll in our school? They can enroll at any year level, and that doesn't even doesn't apply only for primary. I think that's uh, for secondary as well. We have a system in place to support those students right from the start. So depending on their prior knowledge um, of the language, um, and they um, are grouped together in the German as an additional language course. So there are while the mainstream class or the students who have been with us for a longer time have the mainstream german class they um, have a, a special group uh, usually it's a small group five to six or eight students who are together and have no prior knowledge of german and they have german intensive or german as an additional language um, only for them but it would be it would be easier for the child to to start earlier at our school rather than later especially like year four definitely usually it's uh, the, the earlier the better that's a general uh, a rule uh, but even in year five in year four starting at the start of year four it's not a problem at all so we are prepared for that as well okay thank you and how would you actually sorry i'm just uh, i said it's the last question i never have a last question <laughs> <laughs> so and if a child comes from germany and they are obviously at the northern on a northern hemisphere school calendar how would you um decide in which year level the child that has for instance completed let's say year two and um is now applying for 
entry in July, which is the middle of our school year, uh, how would you decide where the child should go? Uh, it's, it, this is a very difficult um, uh, question anyway. So um, we would have a lot of conversations with the family uh, beforehand uh, via Zoom or via uh, uh, Skype or MS Teams to get an idea how the students are. Of course, there are the report cards that we get, but usually they are already a little bit older. So it's always uh, good. We would uh, start contacting the, the parents and figure out what's the best place uh, for the students. Because sometimes, depending on the age as well, because there can be an, a, a range of uh, one year or 11 months, and that's quite important in primary school. So depending on the, on the age level, uh, we would suggest uh, to go or to repeat half a year um, if, for example, the English language is not, uh, um, not at a high level, so because there are, then there are more, uh, more factors that play a role. It's uh, um, starting a new life for the kids, is starting a new life here in Australia, leaving all the friends behind. So there's a lot of uh, social emotional change happening as well as uh, a change of approaches to teaching and learning and then this additional language. So uh, we try to um, 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 yeah, get a clear picture beforehand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, back to preschool. Um, so another question from Anna. If we start with two days per week in the preschool, do we have to pay per semester or is any part of payment possible? Um, for instance, by month. Let me just answer that first part of the question um, as a registrar, it's kind of my job. Um, so um, with the two-day group, you wouldn't be paying the full fees for five days anyway. So we have fees for two days, we have fees for three days, and we have fees for five days. Um, so you would only pay for the two days. And if you, for instance, start, let's say, this year, let's say um, next term, um, yeah, from the 12th of October, um, you would only pay half of the semester fee for the two-day group. So it's pro rata, um, and it depends on the attendance, of course. Um, and then if, if you say, okay, you, let's say you would have started at the beginning of a semester, um, we would charge you the semester fee, but um, if you say you don't want to pay the entire semester fee at once at the beginning of the semester, well, the charges are in your account. But you can basically assign a payment plan and you can say that payment plan is monthly or fortnightly and you can set that in your own account. I hope that answers that question. And the second part of your question is how many kids are now in the two-day preschool class? I know I should know that, but I think that's it. Well, I, I, <laughs> I'd like to explain something. Uh, we have an open plan setting. So it's a, they are mixed together. So the five-day children will be here at the same time as the two-day children. Uh, I hope that answer that it might be a bit confusing otherwise. So they are in the two-day group. That's why I just left to get the current list. We have 11 children who come only Thursdays and Fridays. But in addition to that, we have 17 children who come five days a week and they're together. There's 28 and there are going to be some more children starting who haven't started yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Katya. Are there two teachers per group in preschool and kindy? Um, I just want to make sure, Katya, that you know that kindy is part of school um, and that basically that's a school class. So that's basically, uh, Mr. Pedanik has already touched that, but maybe you can answer that again. And preschool is basically for children from three to five year olds. So yeah. for those who are in kindy, they have to be in school. So they are schulpflichtig. Um, sorry for the German, <laughs> but I assume that you understand. <laughs> um, so are there two teachers per group in preschool? No, and more. in preschool, we have a staff ratio of one to 10. That's the legal staff ratio. But we always have to be one person above the minimum staff ratio so that one of us can leave the room when we have to do some admin work or in the meeting or for whatever reason. That means we're usually four to five people um, in the preschool at the same time. And is kindy in primary school? 
as as uh, Silke explained before, had the transition uh, time. So uh, in the first half of the year, uh, there is an additional teacher in the classroom. That's a tr uh, that's a, a transition teacher. But uh, apart from the transition teacher, um, we um, um, uh, there are not all in, not in all lessons there are two teachers. But in German, for example, or in math. There are always two teachers present, um, and uh, also in English, we have two teachers for the kindy. That applies if there was only one class. If there are two class, two kindy classes, then it is more or less, instead of two teachers in one class, we would have three teachers across both kindergarten classes for German, for English, for math, and for Sachkunde, general studies, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Anna, yes, you can uh, start any time during the term. For preschool children, sorry, I'm not even reading the question out, I'm just answering that, that's okay. Um, so basically for preschool children, um, a lot of the children don't turn three exactly in January. So <laughs> basically, they, uh, a lot of children turn three during the year, so it is not uncommon that children start throughout the year which is also good that not all children have to start at the same time and they all have this settling in time at the same time right Silke? Yeah so. we also have older children who start midterm because they move house and arrive later or for various reasons come from a different country so you don't have to be there at a certain time yeah so yeah so basically Anna if you're interested just uh, send us your application. Um, there's one thing to keep in mind that we, our preschool is a school-based school. So our preschool does have also school holidays. And so basically in October, we also have school holidays. And uh, so for some parents, they, they need to know that, you know, you don't want to start in the last week of the term and then there's two weeks of holidays. And then for some parents, that is actually a good idea. It's, uh, you know, they already met some friends and they're going to be in full swing from the next term. So just so you know. Okay, um, I can't see any more questions. So I think we, we have to conclude, conclude this. Um, but if there are any more questions coming up, there's always the possibility to give me a call at preschool or send me an email. Um, the contact details are on the website, so I'm happy to answer anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one more question from Anna. Uh, is there any entry requirement for starting the preschool? Full toilet training, we've already um, touched that, yes. You have to, have be, to be toilet trained legally. They can't yeah. have wearing nappies. Yeah. Um, any other entry requirement apart from being three years old? <laughs> no. None. Three years old and toilet trained. That's all that uh, we yeah. <laughs> Okay, you don't even have to be able to speak German or English, right? Whereas in school, you have to be able you sometimes to sometimes even have children who's, who don't speak either of the languages and speak a different language at home. So that's, we're used to everything. Yeah. But the legal, the two legal requirements really are, they have to be three years of age. So their first day could be their third birthday. And the second one is due to the facilities and the preschool nature of it, that they have to be toilet trained. Apart from that, anything would work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you too, Anna and Katja and everyone for joining us and for um, yeah, helping us out with your questions. And uh, yeah, so we wish you a, a wonderful rest of the weekend and uh, hope to be in touch if you have any more questions or with your application. We have an online application form now on our website and I think we've included that in the email. I keep looking to my colleague because she's been helping me with all these emails. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for joining us, for also for Clemens Pedanik and Silke Beke. And um, yeah, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. You're welcome.